Okay, just setting up the live stream. Bear with me. Okay. So, as you can see, the weather is absolutely wonderful today. <laughs> Looking out the window, it's remarkably accurate, actually. So, let's just check the volume levels. Okay, so the microphone's decided to have a fit and cut its volume by 5 decibels. So, let's see. I'm just going to pull the sound for a moment. This is getting worse. Okay, so yeah, we've got 15 decibels. That's bizarre. Let's go and check. So for whatever reason, Windows has decided to make the sound about a quarter quieter than it should be. Is it working now? No, not really. But it's good enough. We'll just put up with it, I guess. Keith says good morning, sir. Good morning, Keith. Okay, so should we go and have a look at the flight plan? So I've sketched it into a little nav map. Well, imported it from Simbrief, actually. Um, we're taking off uh, runway 04 from Stansted, then flying on a magical mystery tour over the south of England, out across the Channel, across France, down to Geneva in Switzerland. So we will be following, you can see actually it hasn't got the approach built in here, is it? Or it hasn't got the, the full version of it, I'm guessing. Should we go and have a look at this? Show arrival procedures, Geneva. ILS 04. Yeah, I was going to say, we probably want the Indus transition, don't we? So it hadn't got that selected from Simbrief. To make it a bit more sensible. Okay, so let's go and have a look at that in Navigraph. I wonder if Navigraph has got it. Uh, it's got the arrival, but no, yeah, it hasn't got the approach. So, ILS-04 and the Indus transition makes it a lot more sensible. And then if we go and have a look at this on the chart, see there's Indus, so we're just going to be cutting off that corner. It's interesting that that's gone a little bit further there. Anyway, we're not going to worry about that until we get close to the airport. So we've got the, the version of the Airbus with the Pratt & Whitney engines, which I have not seen at all yet, so I'm about to get into it for the first time, and we'll see how we get on. So first things first, I've gone and mapped the keys back because it didn't have any of the key mappings. So I've gone and set my own custom key mappings up. And I'll be following the instructions that I usually follow. So total the ground power unit, that's already on. So then Alt and 1 takes us overhead. Batteries 1, 2 and 3 go to on. Oh, I need to move this view, don't I? It's too high. It's obscuring some of the buttons or some of the labels. Um, let's reprogram this view slightly. That's a bit too far away now. Oh, this is going to be really tricky, isn't it? That's is that okay? That's about all right. So, Control Alt One will let me use that in the future. Okay, so batteries one, two, and three go to one. External power goes to on if it's available, and it is. APU master switch, which is on the lower view, so Alt 2 brings us down here. So master switch goes to on, and APU start goes to on. Then go back overhead, put the IRS switches to align. And the 
display selector goes to your heading status and if we show setting number two now this won't do anything until we go down to the MCDU so we're going to pull this flight plan in from Simbrief actually so can we do that from here directly if we go to a cars request Simbrief then we can align IRS Okay, so IRS, IRS should go to a line there. So if we go back overhead, we should see, yeah, we've got a number that up here now. I thought it should reflect the minutes. Maybe I've got it on um, instant alignment. I might have. Anyway, let's go and program the route. So cost index, let's go and have a look at our... We've got 100 as the cost index. That's nice and easy then. 100. Now let's just go and clear the messages. Yeah, it's got instant alignment on, but the look of it. My word, there's a lot more messages in here now. Flight ID. Um, we'll just put in one, two, three. And we go to the next page and we can go and do the fuel planning. Now will this fill it in for me from the tablet? I think it might actually. If I go Alt 4 is it? No. Alt 6. I've forgotten the, my own keyboard combinations for this. So let's go into my flight and import from Simbrief. Stansted to Geneva and then if we come back into weight and balance, can we go update from Simbrief, apply that to the aircraft. Now, will that allow us to see that directly on um, where are we? If we plot Will it fill these in? Yes, it will, by the look of it. As long as we've got them in the tablet, I'm guessing. Um, it won't let me do centre of gravity, though. Oh, entry out of range. That's interesting. Or maybe that's just saying that it's not going to do it for us. What's happening here? I'm holding the wrong key down. Um, Alt-6 goes back to the tablet. Let's go back to weight and balance. So, 27.6. Six. No. <laughs> I'll get this right eventually. 27.6. Okay. That looks a lot better. And we go to takeoff data. Can we get this straight away? We haven't put flaps in, have we? V1 and VR. Interesting. I'm so rusty with this aeroplane. So what we can do is go Alt-6 and it's got a takeoff calculator, hasn't it? So we can go to takeoff. We can sync this with the aeroplane and calculate and it will give us the V1 and VR, which are both 146, which is fine. So Alt 6, Alt 4, what was it again? <laughs> 146 for both. I can never remember which aeroplanes pre calculate and which ones don't. We're not going to shift for takeoff. We're going to go, uh, that's landing config, that's fine. Okay, so. Go and have a look at the route, taking off from Stansted on runway 04, and we're doing the where is it? Nug B1S. So next page. Oh no, that's not what I want at all. Flight plan. 
Stansted, Sid, 04, press the wrong button. Neg B1S, there it is. Uh, insert that into the flight plan and then scroll down to the bottom. It's got the routing from Simbrief, so we don't have to do that. So there's our destination. We put the start in, so we're going to be uh, landing on 04 using the Lusa 2N. 04. Now remember we've used Indus and the Lusa 2N. Oops, too far. There it is. And insert that. Okay, so that's the basics done. I guess we could go and be ridiculous about this and go and program the ALS before we get there. So 116.6, 44 degree... Oh, sorry, no, 110.9, 44 degree course. <laughs> that's the VOR, not the ALS, that's the ALS. 110.9, 44 degrees. So this is the ILS on the... Um, Uh, the Airbus A300. So 44 degrees and 110.9. Okay, so we've got the basics done. Did we do... I can't remember if this version of this aircraft has winds or anything like that. I don't think it does, does it? Let me just go and turn the um, the tooltips off. They annoy the hell out of me. I had them on while I was trying to figure out how the F117 worked last night and didn't get around to turning them back off again. Okay, so we've got the basics of the route done. So then we're going to go overhead and we're going to go and turn on the ground control flight recorder. Overhead low, Alt 2. No smoking to auto. Of course I'm trying to remember where all the switches are now. Here we go. Seatbelt signs can go to on. Uh, strobe can go to auto. Nav can go to logo. Uh, the trim ATS can go to on or up. This will tell us if the uh, INS system's working. If it isn't on, then we can't do any of that. Well, the switches will come back down again. So probe heat and window heat next. Um, FGCP, so let's come down here and go and turn on the decision height, so turn it to minus 5. And then primary flight control, so we press B to calibrate the um, the, the um, <laughs> altimeters. My head's not working today at all, so it's going to be an eventful flight probably. We can uncage the backup attitude indicator. Wait for it to stabilise. There it goes. We can set the landing elevation. We can do this en route to be honest, but we may as well do it because we're here anyway. So I wonder why this is not showing. Oh, here we go. So if I go information on Geneva, elevation is 1400 feet basically. Um, okay, so Alton 1 takes us overhead. We can take the external power back off now because the APU is obviously up and running. And go back to the tablet and remove the APU from the aircraft. So go to ground equip, remove the ground power unit. I'll leave the chocks on for the moment. 
So we're getting ready to start the engines. So beacon light goes on. Fuel pumps all go on. APU bleed. So the cross feed has to show. It should be showing a vertical line. And then when we turn it on. There we go. Okay, so now we're starting engines, but should we not do the pushback at this point? I guess we should. So we haven't got rid of the chocks, so this is obviously the point at which we do that. I probably need to modify my instructions because they've missed this bit out. So get rid of the chocks, put the parking brake on. Now has this got a clever um, pushback tool built into it? Yes it has Luke. So if I press shift P to push back I'm going to do things one at a time today. I'm not going to try and start the engines while we're pushing back. Or maybe I will. <laughs> so we put this on to uh, system A and then we've got the APU bleed on we'll open the valve for engine number 2 we should see the N2 coming up when it gets to 20 we'll ad advance the fuel switch I'm not going to bother turning with the tractor. I have an empty airport on purpose. Okay, stop the pushback, put the parking brake back on. So you can see, there we go, the power has just cross fed over from the APU over to using engine number two. And if we look overhead, we should be able to now start engine number one. So we're opening the valve for the APU. See the N2 coming up. I've not read, I'm just reading the live stream comments, I've not read any of the instructions yet. It seems to be stabilizing out at about 20% but I've not read the, the proper guidance yet. So I'm just going by eye at the moment to see what happens. It all seems to be happy enough down here. So something I have noticed Some of the switching is different. This is saying TCAS is on standby. TCAS has disappeared off of this panel. There's a weather radar. So is TCAS somewhere else? It's rather interesting. So we have both engines up and running anyway. So now we've got the engines running, the ignition can go back to off, the APU bleed can go off, and the APU master switch can go to off. Uh, we can arm the ground spoilers. 
looking around down here. That's just the weather radar, isn't it? What have they done with Chicas? Where's it gone? Am I being completely blind? Maybe it doesn't have it. Although it says here, TCAS standby. So Warren is saying, don't forget to put V2 into the FMC via the pre-select in the speed mech knob. Good idea, actually. <laughs> Was it one four six? I seem to remember. Uh, we want to set an initial altitude as well. I usually do a lot of this stuff on the um, FGCP while we're taxiing, but I'll go do some of it now. Um, we're going to go straight for altitude news profile mode once we take off to see what happens, to see how well it holds it. So we'll go for 35,000, I think it was. Let's just double check that. 34,000. That's interesting. We're going east on an even number. Hmm. Um, we'll set this to the runway takeoff direction, which will be 44 degrees, I think it is, at Stansted. I'll double check that in a moment. Be trundling down the runway and turning around and coming back again. Forty two degrees. Anyway, so can we pre select nav mode? Yes, we can. And the flight directors are on. We're in nav mode. I'm just double checking what the switches are saying, having not seen this aeroplane. I'm still a little bit flummoxed as to where what they've done with the TCAS, seeing as it's on, unless this is a, just a, a bit of a bug that it's got TCAS on the screen but there's no switch gear for it so maybe it shouldn't be on the screen at all seems odd to me it's inside the new flight computer so inside here so if we go to menu Hang on a second. Oh, just out of curiosity, how is this set? Because this used to vary with the other versions of this. It had takeoff mode. It says, this is operating in auto, but it doesn't say it. So I'm going to go and select that. It's always been a bit of a grey area to me. Different versions of this light up auto on purpose. Or, you know, initially, and some of them don't. Okay. What 
what's this got hidden in it now? Has it got much more in here? It's the data link, okay. So what's in here? So AOC will be presumably what was there before. I'm just having a nose around now. This has got a lot more stuff, hasn't it? Aha, so there's the TCAS then. Interesting, does that... Yes, that has switched it on then. So this is an entirely different unit now. This is interesting. So if we go to a car main, what's it actually got in it? So CD, CPD, interesting. I wonder if it can actually do a proper a cars connection and I wonder if, it's, I wonder if it integrates with anything. There's an awful lot of this that doesn't do anything. Okay. What's in the AOC menu then? Interesting. Right, I'm not going to delve too much into that until I've read the book on it. It's um, certainly fascinating though. Okay, we're sat here burning fuel. We ought to get on the move, really. <laughs> so, let's turn the head tracking on briefly and just go through the, the final few checks. So, APU, off, APU master is off, speed brake is armed, we have not set the flaps yet. So flaps are set for takeoff. Nose, uh, sorry, um, parking brakes are off. Let's ease the throttles forwards. We should really have the, the lighting on. I'm going to turn the head tracking off because it's being an absolute so and so already. So we should have the nose light to taxi before we go anywhere. Yeah, so I've got my on my notes here during the taxi I would have been setting up the FGCP normally. Um, okay, so we'll taxi down and then we'll get the lights sorted out when we get down to the other end of the runway. We've got quite a long taxi ahead of us. lights on in the cabin, it's a bit dim isn't it? I wonder if the A-cars will integrate with anything like PHP VMS. That would be really great if it did. Let's go and, we're on the Bravo taxiway at the moment. Let's go over to the Alpha. get away from some of the support vehicles. As you can see the weather is wonderful. Checking 
moving things while we're taxiing, making sure I haven't missed anything obvious. It's all looking pretty good. Should put this on the general flight page now. Yeah, I'm going quite fast on the taxi just because it's a long way. <laughs> Rainbow. Good. Okay. So let's see what happens with these Pratt and Whitney engines when you go to full throttle. They're quieter than the um, the Rolls Royce engines, aren't they? turn the head tracking off. Okay, gear up. God, doesn't the airbus make you lazy? Oops, wrong way on the... Just went the wrong way on the flaps. <laughs> oh dear, it shows how rusty I am, doesn't it? So it's aiming for 250 knots now. up to 5,000 feet. We will shortly be coming through 6,000. We'll switch to standard barometric pressure.
Okay, now we got rid of the rain out of the way, the frame rate has improved enormously. It's about to come up through 10,000 feet. This thing is going upstairs like a bat out of hell, isn't it? We're in icing range, so I guess we need to go and deal with that. Oh, wrong one. Um, 10,000 feet, there we go. So. Okay, so this in, is in auto mode, it's gone to climb mode automatically, which is good. True air temperature is 4 degrees, which is just on the edge of icing. Oh, look at that crosswind kicking us around. A little bit of turbulence. Can we see that from the side? What speed are we doing? Okay, we're above 10,000 feet, that's fine. So it's going markedly for speed over altitude, but do we have any restrictions going on? Not really. Uh, flight level 26 estimated for silver. Let's go and zoom out on the... Okay, so silver is when we start to turn back across country. Let's go and have a look at the departure chart. So we're already leaving the departure, really. This is just joining the airway over at Silver. Have I taken a look at the new Inibuilds A320 yet? It's only available, only available in the beta, as far as I'm aware. And I don't have the beta version of Flight Simulator, or beta, depending on where you're from in the world. So Dexter says, does the click spot um, left above the PFD for takeoff still work with this update? I wasn't aware there was one. The red square or button left or above the PFD. Well, that's the primary flight display. There is no red square or button unless I'm missing something. I wasn't aware that there was anything like that. Oh, for Toga, you mean? Sorry. Um, I don't usually bother with Toga in the aeroplanes. I just go and push the throttles forwards. On occasion, I do on the 737, just because there's a little button on the side of the stick right next to you anyway. So. Yeah, so it's interesting how this went very markedly for speed before it started climbing when it went through the 10,000 feet and you know when the 250 knot um, restriction was removed so we've got minus two degrees but obviously there must be some moisture in the air out there still otherwise this wouldn't be saying this I need to, I've got the book on the shelf behind me with the head, the meteorology, meteorology book. Um, I need to go read it to know about, obviously the aeroplane is saying that, but it may be perfectly safe to turn off the anti-ice measures. Because ice can only form in given air pressures and temperatures. See, we're minus 30. Oh, it seems frozen. There it goes, it's just working back up. But minus four outside. Oh, 
So yeah, I need to learn a lot more about that. About, although the aeroplane might say it's in icing range, it may be of no concern whatsoever. These clouds look a bit odd today, don't they? Coming up to 21,500 feet, aiming for 34,000, doing a profile climb. So we're over the centre of the UK at the moment, but then we'll continue on down towards Geneva. So just out of interest, um, if we put this on plan mode, just going to go and have a skip through it. So it's estimating top of climb just before the Midhurst VOR. If we go and skip through the plan, I just want to see where it's got the top of descent penciled in. Okay, so the Lusar waypoint. Okay. As long as we know before Lusa, then we need to start getting ready. That's all fine. So, flight plan. And put this back on map mode. So, we don't need to worry about descending until we're getting into this area before Lusa, then we'll start preparing and so we've got this kind of racetrack approach, which is I always find them quite entertaining to do these. We're still saying icing range, but we'll leave, yeah, we'll, we'll trust it and leave the icing measures in place. I'm really looking forward, actually, for the 146 to come out with the new, um, or the accurate flight computer. I think that's going to be great fun. It's going to be clunky as hell, but it'll be great fun to program. So, Maverick says I'm one of the most informative and helpful YouTubers out there. Well, all I'm really doing is sharing what I'm learning with you guys. Um, and quite often I'm either one page ahead or one page behind. Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you very, very much for the feedback. Yeah, the 146 Professional V2 is going to be very good because of that flight computer. It's finally got the accurate flight computer. They're also working on the Avro version of the 146, which was the glass cockpit, the later version of it. That will be interesting. There's so many aeroplanes that are in development at the moment. There's an MD-11 in development as well, and a DC-10. It would be fascinating to see how well they work. I talked to the developers of the MD-11 before Christmas and was trying to get hold of it because they did a, an early release quite some time ago but they've kind of scrolled away and got hard at work to improve it because I think it got some bad feedback which is always the danger if you release something very early oh yes so Maverick's saying about the analog A300 coming out this year there's also just flight I've got plans for an A4 uh, A747 sorry a, listen to me, a 747 Classic, which I'm guessing that's going to be the 100 or 200 variant, the, the old steam gauge version of the 73, uh, 7, 747, so the one that required four crew to fly, and there'll be one of us. <laughs> so I think you used to have pilot, co-pilot, navigator and engineer on the deck of the 747.
same as with anything like um, Concorde. Yeah, planes of that era typically had four crew. Okay, the icing warning has gone out. So we're almost up to cruise altitude, then we'll t turn the seatbelt sign off and can relax. <laughs> Noisy sounds down there, isn't it? Thirty thousand feet, four thousand left to go. So, let's have a play with this while we're flying along to keep ourselves entertained. Which is coming out over the south of the UK. If we tune in the Midhurst VOR, was it 11400? Oh, of course this won't let you, will it? Unless you're... Unless I switch over to VOR mode. Yeah, okay, no. Maybe we won't. I was wondering if I could double up and have the DME working from the VORs while also using the GPS, but I think you can only do that in modern aeroplanes, to be honest. The older ones are a little bit less um, flexible, <laughs> let's put it that way. I was reading some fascinating feedback on the C-17 from somebody else's video while I was cribbing to try and learn how to operate the C-17. It's a shame the one, although it's a community project, so you can't really complain. The In the real world, the C-17 has all sorts of functions around being able to um, cross-feed the electricity and the air pressure to spin the engines up across all four engines. So you can play any strategies you like around getting one engine up and running first and using it to get the others up. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was fascinating. Obviously, it's a military aircraft, so they've got lots and lots of redundancy built in. So you can kind of hot... Well, not hot wire, that's the wrong word, but you can um, basically reconfigure the plumbing of the aircraft as you, you know, as you need to. I don't think the C-17 available, obviously the community one, it isn't quite that good. It is still pretty good, amazing, considering it's free. It doesn't have navigation built in properly yet either. You end up doing heading navigation in it all the time. It's a bit of a shame, really. OK. Coming up to 34,000 feet at last. So we'll go and turn the seatbelt sign off. and the passengers can run to the bathroom. <laughs> Let's go and increase the range on the navigation display. And yeah, this has gone to cruise mode, that's good. So surface air temperature, Minus 55, oh my word. But true air temperature outside is 20, minus 26. It was too cold for ice to form, basically. Um, I've not read any of the instructions about the new ACAR system yet, so I will be the blind leading the blind if I try and find anything within it. So we can have a little look at it, though. So AOC is where you would normally get your weather, for example. So let's do weather, ATIS. Uh, weather forecast. Uh, does it not put the 
Okay, let's try and do one for the destination then. So LSGG. LSGG. I have no idea how this is going to work, by the way. Um, should we do Meta? So, interesting though, what happens if we click these? Okay, that's just what it's going to try and get, I guess. So send that. So this is the received messages. So there is no response yet. So I'm guessing to get straight to the messages page, you would go to ACAR MSG, which is this I'm guessing. Yeah. So LSGG request meta LSGG. So if we look in there, do we get a response note? Wonder how it indicates that there's a response. Wonder how long it takes. So just reading Maverick's comments there, yeah, I, I watched a couple of the guys that were working through the new flight computer in the 146. To be honest, that's the only bit I'm interested in. But um, I wonder how you get on the shortlist for Just Flight for them to give you advanced access to things. I think they only give them out to professional pilots, as far as I've seen. The only exception to that seems to be Two-Tone Murphy, who get, seems to get a lot of early access to things. Um, but yeah, as far as I've ever seen, Just Flight will only let professional or retired professional pilots have early access to anything. Requests for the weather. Interesting. what open means. It's not very fast, is it? Well, however it works. But anyway, we're delving around, we don't understand what we're looking at. I'll have a little, little bit look back in there later on. I mean, it's, it's pointless really, because we can just go to Navigraph and open the weather up. And there it is. And we can even see the weather en route, to be honest, because we've got Navigraph here. So we can see cloud cover, we can see the weather radar, and there it is. So it's pretty clear over Geneva then. It should be okay. Well, it's not raining at least. Let's have a look at the cloud cover. Okay, so maybe the, we'll be on the edge of a... Although this is done at altitude, isn't it? Let's go and drop this down to 6,000 feet. Yeah, so we're fairly clear. Clouds are starting at 10,000 feet and getting thicker, so it's broken, really. Very cool. How do I walk around the cabin? So, one way, I've got the cursor keys mapped. So, going sideways and forwards and backwards. I think by default the simulator has forwards and backwards going up and down. Whereas I swap it, so I've got Alt and up and down to move me up and down. Which means I can then just use the arrow keys and then use the right mouse button and drag to steer. So I can almost do it like a first person shooter. And then we can go and wander around the cabin so we can make ourselves a bit taller. Pretend we're my height. So if I was going to be my height I'd be up here somewhere. I'm quite tall. So go and put the kettle on. Does any of this work, by the way? Is there like an unofficial arms race now to make working extra bits and pieces inside the aeroplanes? Have they actually gone to the level of making all the numbers on these? They have as well, look. 
the numbers, although that's um, <laughs> it's reversed. I'm guessing if we come over this side, it'll be run the wrong, run the right way. So yeah, that's interesting. So we've got the galley. That's 300 loads of um, melted cheese, something or others. That they're going to be giving it. So yeah, I just use the cursor keys to move around doing this. It's not difficult. Actually, can we look inside the... Do these open? Why would they have bothered bottling it? Okay, maybe not. Ah, uh, what have they done at the back of the aeroplane? So is this the, um... Where you get the optional panels, the blank panels that that like the one that blew out on the, the Boeing the other week. It's great how the sound is changing as we move down the aircraft. Another galley. Another 300 lots of um, pre-packed stew or something or other. And the toilets. Oh my word, there's a flat screen. Remember years and years ago when aeroplanes used to show movies on a projected screen at the front, on a wall, basically, like a partition wall. And you'd all have um, uh, headphones that were just on a pipe. It wasn't, they weren't even electronic. Anyway. Cruising along. We have some time to kill. So it's going to be a little while until we get down to Lusar. Let's have a look on Little Nav Map. So we're doing 400 knots. If we measure the distance down to Lusar, that's probably about 300 miles, so about three quarters of an hour until we get down there. 40 minutes or so. That's based on we're doing 400 nautical miles in an hour and it's 300 down to Lusa, or just under. So yeah, 35, 40 minutes we'll be down at Lusa. It's funny, somebody sent me um, a nice message the other day asking if I could do some videos illustrating uh, our nav approaches, which seem, seems to be a recurring question, because I think people learn how ILS works, and then they see a chart for our nav, and they think, well, what do I do? And I, I kind of sound like a scratched record, but it's like, oh, our nav is area navigation. It just means follow the instructions. <laughs> so yeah, use all of the tools in your arsenal to figure out where you are, to be where you should be, and to descend on the path you should descend with. The, the nice diagrams they give you on the plate. So Edmund says, I remember the days when they had those movie panels and also monitors would drop from overhead compartment during the cruise and retract on descent. Yep, remember those. I flew to America, oh, many years ago now. Must be 20 years ago. It was one of the Virgin 747s that had the girl on the nose. Or well, there may have only been one of it. But anyway, it had um, Super Nintendos built into the seats. So you could play Super Nintendo games, but they were all loaded from a central gaming system that was obviously hidden away somewhere in the aircraft. So you had to request a game and it would load it. I'd completely forgotten about that until you mentioned that, yeah. We flew to the States maybe 15 years ago now to visit family and there was an inter interactive entertainment system among all the passengers where you could play quizzes against each other and things like that. 
And that kept my other half busy for most of the flight, to be honest. So, Primo Victoria is saying, was thinking of buying this plane, it's a very, very good aircraft. It's well simulated, it's, um, it's more in-depth than most. And the great thing about the aircraft like this one is things make sense. So, you know, although it looks like a lot of dials and switches and things, they actually make sense once you start to get an idea of how all the systems hang together. And you can play games with modelling failures and stuff like that because everything is wired up correctly. So doing something will cause the natural, you know, natural result of doing that thing. I'm not sure that it's got all the breakers modelled though, so having said that. No, it hasn't. Some of the aircraft in the sim, I think the Phoenix has got all the breakers modelled. Anyway, I'm going to shut up for a while. Um, oh, Edmund is saying, have you tried out the Zeppelin? It looks more like a crew management. I'm not sure it's actually out yet, is it? I looked recently, I think only a few content creators have been given copies of the Zeppelin. I wasn't sure you could actually buy it yet. I went and had a look on the, is it Red Wing? The same people that made the Constellation? I keep umming and ahhing about buying the Constellation. The um, I know, I think the only thing that puts me off the Constellation is early in its development life. There were lots and lots of issues with it. Uh, but I, as far as I understand, a lot of them have been cleared up. But the, the big problem for me is the DC-6 is just so good comparing the constellation against it. The constellation is probably going to do very badly. And it's only natural in your head to start comparing things, so... But maybe I should just get over myself and go and buy it. Um, well, let's go and have a look then. So if we go and open a web browser, and we'll go to... is it Red Wing? Simulations? Let's have a quick look while we're flying along. So, hang a visit. The Super Constellation. The Hindenburg. Buy it soon. So I think it's there's advanced copies have gone out. Yeah, releases soon look. So I think advanced copies have gone out to particular content creators. But that's it so far. You'll probably find those content creators have um, shared lots of content with other products made by uh, Red Wing. But the, uh, the Super Constellation has interested me for ages. I just haven't got around to buying a copy of it. Anyway. But yeah, the, um, the Hindenburg does look like fun, just from the point of view of it being fairly complicated and there's a, a bit of a psychological failing, I think, of lots of us that like the study level aeroplanes, that the fascination is in the systems, isn't it, of understanding how it all hangs together. And the more complicated, as long as it makes sense, the more complicated, the more fun it becomes in a strange sort of way. Right, I'm going to go and make a coffee while we are en route. I'll be back a little bit later, so I'm actually going to go and mute the microphone. So I'll be back soon.
Okay, I'm back. Let's go and remove the pinned comment from YouTube, I suppose. So let's go and see where we are on the chart. So we're just turning in towards Lusa. So we can't do distance measurements in Navigraph, can we? It's a bit of a pain. So if we do a measure straight across here, so we're about 120 miles ish away from top of descent. So let's go and refresh our memory. We have to be above 20,000 feet at Lisa. That's the restriction. It means you can be at any altitude above that, to be honest. Then above 16,000, what we're really interested in is if we have to be below any altitudes. Otherwise, no, we don't have to be. There's no altitudes we have to be at. We can check that on the chart as well. So let's go and have a quick look at this. So coming in, that they're all aboves, all the way in. So you're really aiming for 7,000 feet by Indus. So what's the altitude of the airport itself? 1,400. So looking at the approach chart, let's just get familiar with this now. So what altitude? It wants us at 6,000 feet at Belka. That's kind of your guide. Yeah, so these charts are invaluable. If you've never looked at one of these in detail, the approach charts, the bits down the bottom are the best bit. Because it gives you, at various distances, the, um, the altitude you need to be at. Which is really, really useful. But obviously, as soon as we turn in Indus, we should pick up the ILS pretty quickly. And then we pass through the Passeri VOR. And then we're into the Geneva final approach. I think our controls just had a fit. So let's have a look around, make sure they're still in the right places. Yep. So you can see here's our routine, there's our top of descent marked at Lusa. Obviously we can use um, spoilers on the way down if we need to descend any more quickly. It's a remarkably stable aeroplane isn't it? Shall we look outside? It's incredibly noisy. So can we view our flight plan? Okay, so it just gives us the OFP. That's interesting. Okay. And you can drag. That's good. Pilot in command name, Jonathan Beckett. <laughs> so there's the routing information. There's the clearances. There's our loadout. It's very cool, isn't it? having access to all this information these days. It's very useful.
Right, I didn't actually get around to making that coffee, so I'm going to nip away now. I'll be back in a moment. Just make sure this is still okay on the volume. It's just looking fine, isn't it? Okay, back in a minute.
Okay, I'm back. I have coffee. I may need it looking at this descent. Um, just looking at the weather right in front of us. Doesn't look great, does it? I wonder if the weather radar does work in this. It does. Oh my word. Very cool. So can we, does the... I don't think the angle has much effect on it. Oh, that's a shame. Please excuse me, I'm eating small chocolate eggs while I'm in between doing things. <laughs> it's Easter Sunday on the day of streaming, which is the day we all eat enough chocolate to kill a small rhinoceros. Or to make it very poorly anyway. Right, 40 miles away from top of descent now. We might not see much for a while. Although saying that, look, at lower altitudes, it's, it's not too bad. We're in the middle of this kind of misty layer. So, let's just refresh our memory. I think it was 7,000 feet we need to aim towards, isn't it? So, 6,000 at Belka. So, if we set a managed descent towards 6,000, obviously we don't need to do it yet, but when we get closer to Lusar, so let's go and zoom in a bit more, so we can see Lusar coming now. So if we set 6,000 feet and go for profile mode and just see what it does. I'm not sure the A300 will follow restrictions on the way. Or I, I can't remember now. I think it may do, but the, um, the guide marker for the descent doesn't. So it straight lines it. Check the volume levels, looking good. Okay, the rest of the family have just got home, they've been out for a walk in the cold and wet. <laughs> okay, 20 miles to run. As you can hear, the rest of the family are being the usual quiet selves. Hey, we just start doing something about descending very soon. I was just showing you on the chart. We're just coming in towards Lisa. Top of descent is just before it. 
and then we're looking for being above these various altitudes on the way in. Obviously we will be well above them because we're at 34,000 feet at the moment. The minimum is 200 or 20,000 feet. And then to... So we want to get down to 6,000 feet by the time we're on... I think it was Belka, wasn't it? Just double check that. Yeah, 6,000 for Belka. And then follow the glide slope in, basically. Oh, I didn't realise you could put this into three dimensions. It's rather interesting. Presumably you can get it back, though. Or not. Oh dear. I appear to have mangled Navigraph spectacularly. Okay, so you have to do this in two steps. There we go. Right, so here we go. 6,000 feet we're going to ask for and put it on profile mode and see what happens. Is it going to descend? And there it goes. It took a while to have a think about it. I think it was just pulling the throttles back before it brought the nose down. Thirty thousand feet. We're coming down at a rate of knots, aren't we? If we zoom out, has this got a green banana on it? It hasn't, has it? So we'll figure it out as we get closer to the destination. So we want to be flight level two hundred. Oh, well, that was the the. Um, this is interesting, isn't it? Because that's saying plus, okay. So that's its way of saying above. So we're on target with the flight directors. We've got a pretty strong crosswind by the look of it. 70 knots from the uh, from the south. Or from the southwest. Obviously as we descend the wind will abate, so we got we're back in icing range again, so we'll go and put the icing controls to on. We we'll descend towards Geneva. You see the mountains out in the distance now ahead of us. So we've got auto throttle on. It'd be interesting to see how well it manages the speed or if we have to intervene. It'd be interesting also to see if it stops descending at 10,000 feet to allow the speed to come off to come down to 250. Okay, we're turning in now towards Kirko, or no, Lurko, sorry.
Okay, so you can see there's a discontinuity here in the plan. So it'll be worth having a look at that. Have we got some vectors in here somewhere? Go from Kerad. Oh no, it's just a long leg out, so it just can't see it. And then we cross over to Indus. So if we scroll down... Oh yeah, we have got discontinuity, yes. I completely missed that earlier. And we can't... Okay, so we can't remove it. Because there's a manual in front of it, okay. The reason for that, in the real world... There we go. The reason for that in the real world is, if you've got manual, it means basically you're wait once you fly out in this direction, you're waiting for ATC to vector you onto the approach. So you would continue on in the direction you're going. Um, Emmanuel, the the um, Airbus the Airbus pilot now used to be a Boeing pilot, um, did a really good um, session on his channel about that about people removing discontinuities when they really shouldn't. Or removing vectors, I should say. So we're down to 19,000 feet and descending. Speed is coming off. I'm going to help the aeroplane slow down to expedite the decrease in speed. So I've extended the spoilers. That's interesting though, look, it's now wanting to increase in speed again. Now was there... I didn't notice anything on the chart earlier about that. Was there a speed restriction? How strange. Oh no, here we go, max 250 knots. 8,000. Interesting. Oh, that, but we're way above that at the moment. That's for a different route. Now we're going for 250 knots. So I'm just expediting that using the spoilers. Okay, put the spoilers back away. So we're now doing 250 and the airplane will start descending again. Should the... So just reading the live stream comments from Johan. Should the TMS be in descent mode on landing as well? That's a really good question. I'm sure if you go and read the documentation on it, I, it's a long time since I looked at it, I can't remember. Doesn't it not just manage maximum thrust? It's got like maximum continuous thrust and things like that. Um, I can't remember it having a descent mode without seeing it. Okay, let's remove the range down again. So we're at 17,000 feet. We're not losing height quickly enough, are we? Let's get the spoilers out. There we can see the the market is coming in, look. Of when we're going to get to our target. We need to be there at Belka, don't we? And we also need room to dis decelerate as well. So if we look out across the valley... We have just passed a little while ago where the airport is. Can't quite see it from here. So 
go and have a look outside. So we've got these little spoilers, and they're making an enormous difference to the aeroplane. Just shows, doesn't it? They don't look that big, but they do make a huge difference. They're basically allowing us to descend at two and a half thousand feet a minute, consistently. So as we come down through the transition altitude, which will be, let's go and check what that is, it will be on the approach chart, 7,000 feet. We'll need to go to the barometric pressure for Geneva, which is 997 hectopascals, or 2944 in inches. Okay, put the spoilers back away. We're pretty much on target now. I've extended flaps to first stage. Just coming down through 10,000 feet very soon. I'll extend the landing lights. I think that's the airport over there. It's obviously this ridge we have to clear, which is why there's altitude restrictions on the way in, and plus all of these hills. So let's go and extend the landing lights. We should have had the um, <laughs> seatbelt on by now, but we'll do it now. Second stage of flaps. Got the ILS tuned in, 110.9. Let's just go and double check that. So you can just we really see we're turning in here towards Belka. We should be coming in for, we're a little bit high still, aren't we? Should we help the airplane out, let it descend? Doesn't seem to want to. Maybe we're okay. Let's put the landing system on. Okay, oh, has this not got the same system? It hasn't, has it? We have to do it here, don't we? There we go. So, oh, we're not far away on vertical deviation, but we're way off on the ILS. Okay, I'm going to take control. Do we have to press this to make it shut up? There we go. And we're over speeding the flaps slightly. Let's turn the auto throttle off. Let's take over control of the aeroplane completely. So what we're looking to do, if it will let us, is the, are the spoilers actually working? They are now. Yeah, we're getting an overspeed again because of the spoilers didn't kick in. Again, it's probably a controller problem on my end. There we go, we're losing some speed now. So we can lose some height and get back onto the glide slope. For some reason, the profile mode didn't bring us down 
as much as we expected it to. So we're down below, now what was the Q&H? 997. This is one of those kind of time compressibility issues where if you've only got one person doing this, it becomes a problem. I'm trying to do two, th two or three things at once. I'm going to have to leave the co-pilot's altimeter out of the story completely. So we're still descending. Are we going to get down on time? Or oh, we're really pushing it with the, the speed. Here comes the glide slope. We might just about make it, you know. We're over speeding though. No, this isn't gonna work. We're far too high, far too fast. Okay, so what else should we at the moment? Let's go for three, 4,000 feet. We're gonna climb back out. We're going to match our heading on 42 degrees. Accelerate back out to Two hundred knots. Autopilot back on. And we're gonna fly the reciprocal, so we're gonna go vertical speed mode if it will let us. Actually will it allow no, it allow us to do a level change up to four thousand? No. So 200 knots, and we'll do a reciprocal angle, so 40 degrees is going to be uh, 220 degrees, isn't it? So heading select, we're just going to fly a circuit, and then go and reacquire the ILS. So we're back up to 4,000 feet. Turning right to 20. We actually, we'll come back up to 6. So we're going to come back in where we should have been earlier. If in doubt, go around. <laughs> the only reason I'm climbing higher is because I remember there were these ridges here and yeah, it would make sense to be back where we should have been earlier. So if we look on the map, you can see we've just done a U-turn here. We're going to fly back down and come back in at Belka and reacquire the ILS again. That's not too difficult. So what's the wind doing? Can we see that on little nav map? You can see it actually quite neatly here, look. So yeah, that's gonna work fine, I think. So back out to Belka. Actually, we don't have to get as far as Belka, really. So it was 6,000 feet for the entrance into the ILS, wasn't it? Um, this chart, sorry. Yeah. This gives us the opportunity as well, actually. Now we've got some time to go 997 on the co pilot um, altimeter. OK, 
Okay. Put the gear back up while we're flying around in circles. Oh, that's the, the gear switch didn't just work. Interesting. That's why I couldn't slow down. I'd completely forgotten. The um, the gear switch is a three position switch in the A300. That's why I didn't get the drag from the gear that I was expecting to. So the gear didn't descend. Interesting. Okay. So if we go and look back at the the chart here, we're just coming back past the uh, Passeri VOR. You can see it on um, Little Nap Map Best, can't we? So we're flying a couple of degrees to the left of the course we should be on, but the wind, that's countering the wind quite nicely. Whoa, what happened to the wind? We, have we got a tailwind? Did the wind turn around when we were en route? When we took off it was three knots. That would explain a lot. Although this is saying five knot wind, but up here it's 30 knot the wrong way. And maybe on the ground it is five knots. Okay, so that would explain as well why we had trouble slowing down and descending. So we had a massive tailwind all the way in. Obviously, once we got down into the bottom of the um, the valley, it was fine. Okay, so we're going to turn right again. To 40 degrees. Okay, let's get the speed back down then. So we should be a lot happier this time. And go for 160. So we just crossed over the centre line. Yeah, we're still far too high. This is bizarre. I think I have to press that to make it shut up. I'm just going to bring it in. I'm wondering if there's something else going wrong with this, because that was absolutely bizarre. So obviously we can see the ILS here. I'm worried about the speed increasing, but we'll lose the speed as soon as we get over the not descending again. It's this I think it's this tailwind is doing it, isn't it? We're not gonna slow down in time. It's, it's just, the wind is carrying us along the valley with the nose down. We've got the spoilers out, flaps down, gear down, and we are just barreling along until we get just out of the wind and then we're okay. We'll see what we can do. OK, 
coming down onto the glide slope finally. We're way too fast. So we're going to have to stay just off the runway. Of course. Two, three. And now it's stuttering like crazy. Look at it stuttering. That wind is doesn't agree with the charts. Yeah, look, we're not slowing down. Oh my word. I've never seen this happen in the simulator. So what is little nav map saying is the wind we are experiencing in the aeroplane? 10 knot headwind. We had a 30 knot tailwind at the other end of the airstrip. This is just bizarre, isn't it? Unbelievable. I've never seen weather behave like this in the sim. Ever. From one end of the runway to the... or from one end of the approach to the other, we had the wind turn round by 40 knots. So I'm going to go fully manual and just bring it in by hand. I've never seen it do that. So from being over there, we had a 30 knot tailwind. By the time we were here, it swung around to being a 10 knot headwind, but only when we were halfway along the runway. When we were here on finals, we were barreling along, being blown along the runway. I wonder if there's some sort of bug going on with the weather today. I wonder if that could cause it. Very, very strange. Yeah, look, we're being blown along now. We're struggling to slow down at idle. So I'm going to put the gear down again before we turn in. Right, let's try this again. Air show landing, here we go. With the most bizarre weather I've ever seen in the simulator. I'm intentionally slowing the plane right down. going to bring it in from a crazy angle on purpose. So we're idle on the engines at full flaps and do we need spoilers? I'm going to throw the spoilers out as well in case it happens again. Yeah, the trouble is the spoilers destroy the lift on the wings. accelerating again. Okay, full spoilers. That's just about holding it. No spoilers again. And we're out of that wind now. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, 
Yeah, we're okay now, look. That ridge. Oh no, it's not, it's just an angle on the. Okay, let's get off the runway. Spoilers up, flaps up, wheel brakes on. Oh my word, that was unexpectedly eventful, wasn't it? Whoops. Of course, now we have to fight with the head tracking to go and turn off the, the lights. It was, I think there may have been some sort of weather anomaly in the approach path. Because at one point we were accelerating with the engines on idle with full flaps <laughs> and we were accelerating along the runway. I've never seen that happen. I couldn't get the flaps down, just reading the comments, I couldn't get the flaps down any further because we kept accelerating. I couldn't use the flaps to, to cause us to slow down. It was really, really odd. The second one was even stranger than the first because we intentionally came in slow and we were out of position, which was even stranger anyway. I'm not going to analyse it too much, we got it down in the end. At least I leave all this stuff in, hey? Unlike um, some of the channels that get heavily edited to show perfect flights every time. I think it's how you solve things is often more instructive than when things go well. Or, you know what you see happen because quite often we'll see things happen in the sim and say has no one else ever seen this do this so today it just went absolutely bananas on us didn't it that, f that sounds like the engines are racing why are they doing that saying they're doing. And they look okay. Okay, anyway. If we do we have ground power available here? Well we can we can make ground power become available, can't we? So if we go back into the tablet and go into ground equipment and give ourselves a ground power unit. So rather than wait for the APU we can go over to ground power and then we can shut the engines down. But that sounded almost like the APU was on, it was bizarre. think what else we haven't done there's not much to turn off in the airbuses there after after you land bleeds all done so it's just the lights obviously the strobe should have come off when we left the runway but we were too busy chattering about the hilariousness of being blown along the runway at 100 feet
Okay, so external power back off, and then turn the batteries off, and we're cold and dark. So Benji is saying it's freakishly accurate. Geneva right now is 90 degrees, 6 knots, and a few miles southwest, it's 240, 10 knots. It's absolutely bizarre. It wasn't throttle calibration, it was just the weather. We came in along here. It's a shame I didn't have Volanta running, because you'd have seen it on the track. We came in along here, and by the time I got here, both times, the aircraft was picking up speed, being blown along the runway. Can we put the weather barbs on? Wind at ground. Only NOAA. Oh, it's not really high resolution enough to show us it, is it? But yeah, you can see it. Look, it's swirling. It's going completely different. Look at that. The barbs, although they're not very strong, they're in completely different directions to each other. That's bizarre. I've never seen it like, you know, that marked before. How strange. Anyway, put that one down to experience, I guess. It was certainly good fun, and it made us think about, you know, going fully manual to take over because the aeroplane just couldn't handle it. It got into a mess both times. It was we were we basically fell behind where we needed to be, and only by going manually could we stay ahead of the game with only one person in control. Obviously, on a real aeroplane, you've got two people. So one of you can be trying to figure out what on earth's happening while the other's flying the damn thing. <laughs> so do we get to unload the cargo? This isn't the cargo variant. This is the passenger variant. But we can if you want. If we can go and um, open the doors. So we can say, give us the aft cargo door, the forward cargo door, and toggle the luggage trucks, please. And see all of that happening and just for a bit of fun given what's just happened should we open the doors and let out let the passengers use the bouncy castle will it allow us to do it it's not going to let us do it is it Oh, that's a shame. Can we not? I thought we could use them. Emergency slides. Armed green disarmed. For some reason, it's not letting us use the slides. Oh, they're actually putting bags back in because they're a bit silly like that. One day I'll have to get GSX and then we'll get to see all the people walking across the tarmac. Probably praying and kneeling on the ground, I would imagine, after that flight. <laughs> I think, yeah, that was a really good illustration, though, that you can get odd conditions sometimes where going manual is the only way out of it trying to fight the aeroplane to get the aeroplane to behave. We were just too slow most of the time, you know, in reacting to what was going on. So in those situations, just switch everything off and fly the aeroplane. As soon as we did that, we could see relative to the throttle and the flap and spoiler positions we had, we could see what was happening with the indicated airspeed. And it all suddenly made it a bit more manageable. Right, I'm going to leave it there anyway, and I'll see you all again soon. That was good fun. Being put through the ringer. <laughs> see you soon.